तो बचपन में हम मराठी बोलते थे हम वहाँ पर सेवाग्राम में लेकिन मुझे बहुत कम याद है मराठी थोड़ा समझ लेता हूँ जो तुमने कहा वो सब समझा कृष्ण नोन के बारे में समझा <laughs> लेकिन तो मैं ज़्यादातर इंग्लिश में बोलूँगा क्योंकि ये स्पेशलिस्ट सब्जेक्ट है तो आ, लेकिन जहाँ हो सके मैं थोड़ा हिंदी ले आऊँगा अगर हो सके तो सो वी लिव इन एक्स्ट्रॉडनरी प्लेस इन दूनिवर्स देर इज नथिंग लाइक इट इन इन वी नो at least three light years distance and it takes light to get from the sun to here it takes 8 minutes for the light to travel from the sun to here and you imagine that light traveling for 3 years how far that is so we are in a and, and as far as we know there aren't any planets inhabitable planets on the nearest star so we are in a very incredible place you can say that it's a miracle or you might say it's divine will which is actually the same thing as a miracle and the mathematical possibilities of it are extremely small so not only is this a, a very special place but even if you look at the planets from the sun just a few thousand miles here and there it would not have worked we're just in that place where the sun and its distance and the energy we get from the sun is just the right amount and it wasn't always like that it has only been like this for a brief period of time and on this planet we live in a very thin layer so the previous slide you probably know was from apollo 8 this is apollo 12 1969 it's taken from a place where the moon was in front of the earth and the sun was behind and that crescent is the earth's atmosphere you are seeing the earth's atmosphere you're probably only seeing the troposphere which is not you're probably seeing much of the earth's atmosphere not only the troposphere which is our breathing layer that troposphere is at the largest at the equator 17 kilometers high that's the distance from here to garchiroli so on this in this universe in which we talk about light years we live in this little thin sliver and below us within probably more like 6 7 8 kilometers is magma in places it's boiling at an incredible temperature and we live in this thin slice so in a way i think it's amazing that climate change hasn't already happened well of course it has happened climate change is norm in the in the earth but it's a miracle that we have this stability at all so actually rather than being skeptical about the reality of anthropogenic climate change people really should be skeptical that it hasn't happened they should believe that it is happening and we will see you know what what it is that's causing the, the what what is what are we what have we found about why the climate is changing which is now when i started talking about this we used to talk about it being in the future now we don't need to talk about it being in the future in the time that i have been talking about climate change it has become an everyday reality it was already that for some people but now it's the reality that the common person understands and sees they don't need persuasion but the incredible thing is that this was foretold 100 years ago and it has taken that long to understand it and not 100 years ago but much more recently from 1958 onwards 57 onwards many countries started um, in part of as part of geological scientific investigation many countries including russia have had bases in antarctica and they have used science to understand how the world works and the results of this are phenomenal you know i find it completely amazing what was done vostok welcomes you it says on there that's the vostok ice station and they've started drilling for taking ice samples out from the built up ice shelf in the antarctica and the deepest one 
they made was 2.2 miles of vertical coring into the ice. And these cores look like this. They're literally cylinders of ice that you take out. But when you look at them, inside the ice are trapped bubbles of air. And so these bubbles of air, the further you go down, the further back in time these bubbles are. Many of you will know this. You will know this, but I will tell you that it will be very interesting to me that I will be able to do these things. So these bubbles contain the gases and you can analyze the gases and you can draw charts like this where you can trace the geological record. You can date them because they have layers. You can see the year by year by year. You can count the years like you can count tree rings. You can count how far you've gone. And you can see all the, of course you can't use the pointer on these screens. Like in, down here is the, this, how much sunlight is falling at, at 56 degrees north. That is the methane, that is the carbon dioxide. Top right is the temperature which is derived from something called delta 18 oxygen atmosphere. It, let's not go into it. It's, it it's actually only goes so much into science. But that is a proxy that allows you to project the temperature. So you can see from 400,000 years ago, the temperature and the CO2 concentrations match almost exactly. And this correlation was first shown in 1937. The greenhouse gas effect was first discussed in 1896. So as I say, more than 100 years since it was realized that there were these mechanisms in play. This came out in the, I think the Vostok, this Vostok climate record is probably from the 80s, after about 30 years of research. So that's nearly already 50 years, or 45 years anyway that this was first done. And then hundreds of other scientists have backed this up with their own research. And here is a very up-to-date one, 2023, September. And you can see that for thousands of years before today, the concentration of atmospheric CO2 was never more than around 300 parts per million. And since 1911, it has gone to over 420 parts per million. From 1911 to 1958, our uh, um, extrapolations based on geological data. But from 58, we have the actual record. And actual records match exactly the predictions. So the science is, has been tested and retested, and it's very robust. And these are the projections since 1958 at the Monalawa Observatory in Hawaii. These are by NASA. So we have the Russians, we have NASA, we have the Swedes, we have everybody doing this. And it's interesting, you see this zigzag. So what happens is, seasonally, CO2 levels go up, and then they go down a bit. Because, depending on which part of the world, as Mauna Loa in, in Hawaii is in the... Uh, you know, in the Pacific, but it can pick up that the carbon sinks of the world actually absorb some of that carbon back again from the, so the, 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 when the, you know, when trees blossom and flower, they take, the, uh, take it in and then they leave it out. So it's like the earth is breathing the CO2, but it's going up and up and up and up, and it's still going up. And what we can see now is that this stability has been maintained for about 11,000 years. But this 11,000 years, in the entire history of the Earth, if the Earth was a, if you could put that into a clock, it is the last, less than the last minute of the, of the 24 hour clock that the conditions have been right for human beings to flourish on the planet. And it has been this thing called the Anthropocene, sorry, the Holocene. The Holocene is a period, and the, the word means about that stable situation. 
and before that was the Pleistocene, and now philosophers have come up with this term Anthropocene. We are in the Anthropocene. We are in a period when human activity is going to leave a geological trace where there will be visible trace of the impact on Earth systems through human activity. So, and unless, at the top right you can see, unless we adopt certain trajectories for the future emissions, the atmosphere will become as unstable as seen in the left-hand side of, the, of this chart. I mean, look, look how unstable it was. The Earth was uninhabitable. We are making the Earth uninhabitable. People talk about saving the planet. The planet is going to be fine. The planet has been there for four and a half billion years. It'll be fine. There'll even be some amoeba, there'll be some heat-resistant organisms. There'll be completely, it may well be that new kind of humans will evolve, or new kind of intelligent, sentient beings will evolve in a million years, which will also replace, but we won't be, we won't be there. And along with us, thousands of species, which are already extinct, won't be there. So this is, this is a big thing that is happening, caused by human activity. There are some wonderful visualizations of this. So hopefully this will play. Let me see. It's ah, it's just playing, great. So one big indication of this is the cover in the Arctic of the ice. These are shots in every September for 25 years, more than 25 years, of um, Arctic sea ice. And you can see visibly every September the trend is for that sea ice to get smaller and smaller. Now, it has, this is where we have one thing to understand about the climate, is how the instability of the climate works. People think, well, it's, you know, we are used to dealing with the climate and the atmosphere like a given thing, you know. We, we feel that we are less powerful than the weather and the climate. And we're less powerful than nature. We've always thought of nature as something big and uh, totally forgiving. But within that nature, there are built-in things called positive feedback and negative feedback mechanisms. So what happens when the ice shrinks is that less sunlight is reflected back out of the atmosphere, which means that the ocean absorbs more heat, which means that the ice then melts. So next time, there's less ice and more ocean to absorb it. And this is the, it's called albedo, the property of certain tones of color, especially white, to reflect heat. But you know, every color has its own albedo. White is just the maximum albedo. So if this goes on, the Arctic is predicted to be ice-free. And by the way, a lot of people are very happy about this because they're going to go and sail into the Arctic, drill down and get more oil out of the seabed and the Russians and uh, Canadians are already very happily lining up to do more of that so that we can get even more climate change. So that will be interesting to see. For many years, throughout, well, decades in the 19th century, there was a great mission to find the Northwest Passage can you go from the Atlantic to the Pacific, north of Canada, the Northwest Passage between Greenland and Canada? Can you find your way through? And, you know, several ships perished. They were blocked. Amazing novels have been written about it. There are great tales of leadership and heroism. And in August 2011, the channel was clear. You could sail. To the, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So these changes are happening, and some of these have been happening in some parts of the world very, very visibly, very visibly, no doubt about it. And the Arctic was one of the first places, and there was an artist called David Buckland, a photographer, who decided to take scientists and artists to, the, uh, to, to various places in the Arctic to witness this change. His theory was that the scientists are great at finding out facts, but they're very bad at telling stories. 
Artists are great at telling stories. So if you put them together, they'll go to the Arctic. The artist will tell the stories based on the facts. So I was selected as one of the people to go there and uh, by some fluke. And I went there. We saw this beach, a beach where there hasn't been a beach for thousands of years because that glacier has retreated from being carving into the sea. It's gone way back. And so on this beach, I created an installation with strings and four balloons, with big helium balloons with my, with my colleagues. And that square, there's a square implied in that space. And that is the volume of one ton of carbon dioxide at sea level. So that's a nice kind of illustration. It doesn't really mean very much necessarily, but it, um, it, it, it proved like a, a popular image to, to use for the excursion. So who has put all this greenhouse gas, all these emissions in the air? Well, right now, but well, this is actually maybe a decade old, but it hasn't changed all that much. I think you'll all be familiar who the, the main polluters are and who, who is not the main polluters. But what's interesting to see is that over time, how the how CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases, who contributed what to those in the atmosphere? You can see how England, or Britain, UK, was way ahead of everyone for such a long time, all the way from 1750. I mean, they had no competition, really, for 100 years. And then it starts, and then it gets overtaken by US. And actually, what's not on this um, map is, is the Middle East, uh, uh, Kuwait and, and UAE and so on, and their emissions are actually almost double of these. Uh, and interestingly, you also see that those emissions are beginning to drop. So they have kind of peaked. You might say, oh, that's a good thing, but it is. But that's largely two reasons. One was the OPEC oil crisis in 73, and the other is that coal is being phased out. At the same time, of course, what we have to remember is that there is a strong correlation between GDP growth and carbon emissions. And one of the big things that people are trying to understand is how can we uncouple carbon emissions and GDP growth? So can countries like India and to some extent China and of course countries in Africa, can they achieve prosperity for their populations without going down the same path of high emissions. So this is the kind of thing that's now being discussed as we speak in COP28. They're talking about mitigation, talking about loss and damage, historical repair, reparations, basically. The rich world needs to pay the, the poorer world some money. Loss and damage. It's a very small fund, by the way, and what's been agreed within the first few days. Still very small, but they are working on that. And uh, just coming to India, you can see that India is still well under two tons of CO2 per annum. And this also shows you the relationship between GDP and emissions. You can see the, the color of the graph getting yellow around to, to the right. There are some anomalies, but that's, that's just something that happens. And um, you can see that the highest emitters are also the, the wealthiest countries. We also Australia have... Was, Australia is so high up there, even in the per capita, coal. Australia was very high. Yeah. Australia is a first world country. It has really no... I mean, it has been pretty bad with climate. It has been pretty slow, shall we say, um, in, in climate change response. Um, and they, they just, I mean, they, they have large coal deposits. They haven't uh, abated the use of coal to the same extent. Uh, Canada is very high as well. I mean, the, and if you look at their national policies, they have been not the first in line to, 
to get onto this page. I mean, by the way, I have to say that UK, I mean, in a way, having made those historic emissions, actually passed a law in 2008, the Climate Change Act, which committed it legally to achieving re uh, reductions. Actually, at that time, it was by 80%, but now it's been turned to net zero by 2050. So it's in, in, in law. Uh, and other countries have done it too now. And so on paper, all this is happening. And in COP, you'll find, you'll see many people trying to present the, the, what's going on at COP now as a great success story, but read it carefully and make up your own mind. We know that building and construction in the north, in the global north, is responsible for about 40% of those. So clearly, I, I talk about climate change in the context of the built environment. Here we are talking about it more with health, but actually there's a very strong relationship between built environment and health. And therefore, it's quite important to, re to see where the, where the carbon is, where is it being used. It's a, it's a complex picture, because you might say that the design of settlements and cities has a big impact on how transport is handled. So you, some people say that actually, the way we build our infrastructure, our cities, our roads, uh, including our rural infrastructure, it could be as much as 70% of the emissions are really traceable to that. It's a complex subject. I don't think we'll linger too much on, on, on that because we want to get on to the, the real message. And transport is, having noted that, what I said about the built environment and, and so on. You know, it's very interesting. This was Beijing as the economy in China began to grow and people could all afford bicycles. In the 80s, there was a wonderful picture of people commuting in Beijing on their bicycles. The road is completely full of bicycles. In fact, Richard Rogers, the architect, uh, famous British architect and advisor of the mayor said he was in Beijing talking to the mayor of Shanghai that time, and he said very admiringly, he said, look at all these bicycles. And the mayor said, oh, don't worry, they'll be gone in two years. <laughs> and they were. They were gone. And in the Beijing Olympics, there was a big clear out, and uh, all sort of traditional homes were destroyed, removed. And this image that around the world everybody has, this is the image of the future. This is how we want to live. And actually, the reality of this is that if you want to cross the road here, you probably have to take a taxi, like you do in the UAE. I once was there. I had to go to, uh, I could see the building across the road. And, and they, I, I said, how do I get there? I said, oh, no, you have to take a taxi. It took 15 minutes to cross the road on a taxi because you had to go all the way up. It was in a big jam and then across and so on. So uh, somehow the obsession with the car and the car lobby has been very powerful in shaping cities. Now in rural areas, it's understandable that you, know, you do have to have means of transport, but the paradox is that it's the cities which are choked with cars. And they cause pollution and they have particulates and so on and so forth. But this glittering image, uh, this is of course Dubai, is, is, has captured the imagination of people around the world. And now more than 50% of humanity lives in cities and is set to increase. Um, I think, and, and a lot of attention is being paid to how cities cope with climate change, how they do their bit for mitigation and so on, but much less to rural areas, and which is of course, if we have in this room any traction, it will not be about cities. And this picture goes hand in hand. This inequality across the world exists in microcosm in all these cities as well. This is a real photograph. It's not a collage. This is Rio. And I believe it's Rio. And there you have the condominiums. You have the fantastic apartments. You can see the balconies have pools on them huge balconies, and they're overlooking the favela. 
and we, we have our own version in Mumbai, this is Dharavi, and uh, uh, still holding on. And actually, in many ways, rather an inspiring place if you, if you go there and you see what's happening in Dharavi. So one very useful concept to visualize all of this is the idea that we have only one planet. This is the only, we have, more many years ago, Buckminster Fuller, the American architect who did the big dome in, uh, in the expo in Montreal back in 1967, he used to call it Spaceship Earth. And he said he, he, said he wrote an operational manual for Spaceship Earth. And it's a very good analogy because there is nothing else. This is what we have. But if everybody had the lifestyle of the USA, we would need six, five spaceships like that. But we only have one. EU is the middle one, three, and world average is one and a half. It's still, even the average in the world has exceeded the planetary limit, if you like. And in this planetary consideration, carbon dioxide and emissions are a very serious component, but they are only one of many others. And as the science has evolved, much more sophisticated understanding is emerging of the limits of, of our planet and how we are in danger of exceeding them. And the... Um, Resilience Center, Stockholm Resilience Center, devised this extraordinary model with nine planetary limits. And this is, some of this is a bit too detailed, but I will very quickly describe them. Novel entities basically just think plastics. I, these are things which never existed in the world before, and they have appeared. And now I'm sure you've all read that there's almost nowhere in the world which is free of plastic. There's the seawater, um, the water you drink out of bisleri bottles, they all have particulates to dissolve them. And there are some catastrophic impacts on wildlife, on birds and fish and so on. The plastic is, is and there are ultrafine particulates uh, and they are almost impossible to get rid of. So novel entities, the limit is far exceeded. The, you see, the green is the safe operating place. If you go clockwise, so some good news, we are still okay with stratospheric ozone depletion because we plugged the ozone layer um, following the collapse of the ozone layer in, in the later 20th century through the Montreal Protocol. Atmospheric aerosol loading is dust, basically. There is twice as much dust already in the atmosphere as there was 50, 60 years ago. And that's partly because of deforestation, but also because of smoke, because of stubble burning, fires, and so on and so forth. So that's atmospheric aerosol loading, which is still within limit. And then ocean acidification, which is very dangerous and, and happening, but it's still within limits. Biochemical flows are phosphorus and nitrogen, and that's largely from fertilizers. And we have way exceeded how much the Earth can take of, of nitrogen and phosphorus, mainly derived from fertilizers. And one of the results is the death, death of lakes, which we are seeing. I mean, Bangalore, for example, had 100 something, 130 lakes, I don't recall now, but only a few of them now are serviceable. Now that's not all because of this, it's because of pollution and other things as well. But the dying of lakes is a big, big phenomenon. Freshwater change is, green water is um, precipitation, blue water is rivers and canals and the ocean. And that's not in a good state. Land system changes is basically deforestation for agricultural use and sometimes recklessly without due attention to consequences. Biosphere integrity is extinction of species and there are some very interesting measures. They, they can, you, can, you can say what the historic rate of extinction of species is and what it is now and we'll come back to that. 
And the functional thing is actually, uh, again, a very scientific measure of how much energy from photosynthesis is given off and how much is absorbed back in again, and what that balance is. And then finally, where we were, climate change, and that's radiative forcing. Let's not go into that science just now, but CO2 concentrations, which you can all understand. So, so we are exceeding the limits of the planet, not just from CO2. We could, become, we could reach net zero and still have a, a habitat which cannot support us. And this holistic view is what we need to take. So what's interesting is that it's more and more widely acknowledged. I don't know if anybody has seen Karvi Hawa. I haven't seen it. You have? No. So as I think I know that this climate change is a whole film. काफी बॉलीवुड के मशहूर एक्टर्स हैं उसमें नब ये दो घंटे की फिल्म है तो शायद देखनी चाहिए कभी and the other thing is the national initiative on climate resilience and agriculture I'm just picking out a few things relevant to what's happening in India there are thousands of such things but these I came across so which means we are not alone you know <laughs> there's there are a lot of resources out there to look at some about popular communication some about scientific approaches some about you know all of this very wide front that one has to occupy to deal with this issue so now some specific things which relate back to the impacts of the climate on India, which are already happening, already known, and the sources of this are all on, on this, at the, at the bottom, you can see this is UNICEF, saying that the, uh, India was the seventh most affected country because of climate change-led extremes, extreme weather events. And there were fatalities, but also economic losses. Now, this, much of this is older, older news, but it's still fact, because there's no longer future projections. This is what has already happened. The extreme weather events due to climate change have led to 17 out of 20 people in India being vulnerable to extreme hydrological and meteorological, also called hydromet disasters, that is flood, drought, cyclone. So these are real threats. Um, out there in the rest of the world, everybody thinks of India as a really vulnerable country to climate change. Um, going around India, I don't particularly hear that back because you know, there are other issues to deal with. And, um, uh, but but this, is, this is a general consensus. Um, so there were, you can see, you can read for yourself, 55% increase in death due to extreme heat. In the 22 heat wave, uh, you know, when the Ukraine war happened, the, there was an idea that Indian wheat will replace Ukrainian wheat, which was being held by the, by the war and by the Russians blockading the, the leaving of the grain ships. But India had to ban wheat exports because of the, uh, the far lower yield of grain in that year. So this is a, a, you know, has major world impacts. And the, as back, far back as 2005, the 37 inches of rain in under 24 hours in Maharashtra killed 900 people. And that was directly then related to the warming of the Arabian Sea and the loading of moisture in the air and the precipitation on the west coast. And in the past decade, flooding attributed to extreme rain resulted in loss of approximately billion dollars per year. So we are already experiencing a warming climate, there are unusual, unprecedented weather events, and this is uh, from World Bank. Uh, average rice yields would have been 6% more, uh, and we can expect more reduc reduction in uh, agricultural production, uh, etc. Decline in monsoon rainfall since the 1950s is now quite visible. Um, if there was a two degree rise in world average temperatures, the summer monsoon will become highly unpredictable. And dry years will be drier, wet years will be wet, and you may, and I think there will be successively 
you know, instead of it being an anomaly, there may be two years of drought or three years of bad monsoon. You know, so that's the kind of thing, um, which is has a silver lining. You know, because if you can deal with one year, then you can work out how to maybe collectively we can work out how to deal with three years. And one of the key things at the at the larger scale can be done is better predictions, better warning of populations of these events. So back to species extinction. I mentioned that one of the limits is about species extinction. And this horrendous piece of data, the current rate of species extinction is estimated to be tens to hundreds of times higher than the average rate over the past 10 million years. So I don't know if you've noticed, has anybody noticed, personally noticed species extinction? Can you say, what have you seen? What is, has anything disappeared? Yeah, vultures have disappeared. But that was, of course, because of the antibiotic, wasn't it? And so, I mean, yes, it's anthropogenic activity, but is, is there anything else? Do you notice fewer insects, for example, or not? So, in the UK... Yes. When we drive on bike, ah. at least in my childhood, what I remember is, at night, when I used to drive, and if there was a headlight, yeah. it would draw quite a few insects. And if I would speak with the person on my, sitting on my rear seat, yeah. I would oftentimes actually smell <laughs> some of this. Yes. Now, I drive occasionally, but when I drive the bike at night, I don't see that problem. So right. Has anybody else noticed that? You're on your own there, Amrit. Amazing. <laughs> Maybe insects are attracted to you. <laughs> but in, in, in England, um, when you drove in the summer and you returned home, the screen used to be covered in insects, which you, because you're going at 60, 70 miles an hour on the motorway. Now there aren't any need. People used to sell special fluids to clean insects from the windows, and they're, they're not needed. So this is happening in reality. And by the way, the number of insect species that have already become extinct is in thousands already. I may be depressing you, but there may be good news <laughs> later. And to the main point, really, uh, I think of relevance to search, the climate emergency is a health emergency. This has been recognized widely at the World, World Health Organization, UN, UNICEF, other people, and many, many authorities. And I think the reasons are pretty obvious because you know, the heat strokes and dehydration uh, have already killed people. Uh, you might suddenly find in an extreme uh, event of extreme heat that maybe a lot of people arrive in search, need, needing treatment for these conditions. And droughts, of course, cause water crisis, and the quality of water as well can be very badly affected. But of course, there are longer term food production impacts and potentially crop failures. And flooding can have direct impacts, of course, with, with flooding, but there could also be danger of waterborne diseases. And the extinction and the unpredictable changes in the biome, that is the, the, the entire um, biogeographical ecosystem, that you might get loss of pollinators, the insects, the increase of pests, and maybe novel pathogens uh, that we don't yet know about. So there is a, a, a health, uh, big health dimension to the impacts in the future. So we need to build resilience against these. I would say that for rural and tribal India, I'm hoping you're agreeing, this is kind of a proposition, this is not a, I'm not saying this uh, as a fact, but it, it, I would suggest that climate mitigation and what is happening to do net zero and phase out coal and all that is irrelevant. That is not the urgent task. We can have very small impact on it, if at all. And it would be a distraction to, 
to take on that burden, which is not created by this population. But the mission is how to survive, and actually, indeed, how to thrive in spite of these very serious eventualities. How do we adapt to climate instability? I actually prefer the word climate instability than climate change. Climate change feels like something gradual. Oh, it'll get a little hotter, it'll be raining a bit more. But actually, it's, it's like being on a roller coaster where you can't predict. Catastrophic things happen like that. You know, when, I mean, forest fires is a big thing. When it becomes really hot, you have to, it has to be seen to be believed how fast forests go up in smoke. And even with sophisticated, you know, first world equipment, like helicopters and planes with water bombs and massive resources, in Australia, it took them three weeks or four weeks to control wildfires in the forests. In the United States and California, I understand that it is becoming nearly impossible to insure the wealthy people's homes because of the recurrence of Californian forest fires. So I mean, one thing is that actually the climate change impacts are hitting the first world. And people are, you know, again, for the first world too, again, when, when I started talking about all this and my, my colleagues and I were discussing this, we were always told, ah, you know, maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't happen. It's in the future. But now it's at our doorstep. But I think for, for us here, the mission has to be how to adapt, how to be prepared, how to build that resilience. And it happens that if you do the right things for adaptation, they will automatically help mitigation because all the best solutions are low carbon. They're gentle on nature. They work with nature. In fact, work in na that is almost the, the secret of this. How can we come to a new accommodation with nature where nature isn't something to be conquered and defeated for humankind's benefit, and it, it is something to be worked with? And there are some, I'm going to move on finally to some potential solutions and how one might adapt. What are the small and large things one could do? There are some big scale things which are already going on and people are paying attention to. So there are national agencies who are dealing with the hydromet uh, issues uh, with, with uh, water resource management and, and so on and so forth. And, It'd be good to know about them but probably, and, and see what the impact of those will be in a district like Garciroli. Then there are uh, around the world examples of how people have at large scale dealt with these emergencies. So already there are so many parts of the world where people have experience of all the things that are coming down the line. So for example, extreme heat. People have devised cooling centers, and they're usually uh, shopping malls or um, you know, in urban areas or churches or something like that. They're designated cooling centers, and the poorer people who don't have air conditioning, who don't have any way, they can congregate there for free, they can get food and so on, until the extreme heat passes. Now, is there an equivalent, potentially, that one could imagine uh, when it becomes too hot to be anywhere at all other than a cool space, uh, what can you do? Can we build, build something as part of the, you know, just like as, as communal use? It could be something that is used for other purposes usually, but then it's, it becomes a, a center where people can stay cool. And it's specially equipped with, with you know, very, very guaranteed uh, way of cooling it. So even if there's a power outage, there is some backup or so on and so forth. Because power outages will go together with extreme heat. Then there are small and big things happening in their thousands around, around, around the place. So this one is from a, a company called Sea Balance, who are working in this. So these are just movable, movable sheets with reflective aluminum that can instantly cool homes. You can draw them across. And actually, we have experimented with that here, I believe. 
the Mahila Housing Trust in Ahmedabad has um, fitted some of the homes in the Basti with these profiled aluminium, sorry, profiled bamboo instead of aluminium roofing sheets. So these are natural white bamboo corrugated roofing sheets. So biodegradable, recycl recyclable, good for nature, easily produced, and they re it reflects light. Underneath there is insulation, and they have managed to cool these uh, buildings by five, six degrees just by doing that. And they have a solar panel with some lighting systems as well. Um, bamboo and mud, made to look great. Not, not like a, you know, everybody's culturally moving away from, you know, the kind of tutti putti jhupri type of uh, architecture to uh, something that looks more robust. Uh, everybody's running towards concrete, which is very difficult to, keep cool uh, and can be very bad and it's very resource hungry and very bad for the climate. So can we make fashionable, attractive homes with natural materials and so on? And that's a whole big thing. And rammed earth is another example of that. And there's many parts of India, people are experimenting with these other materials. And this could be a way of uh, not, I mean, this is what I mean by thriving as well as surviving. Already, there is a great wish for everyone to have air conditioning, but can we short circuit that journey to air conditioning and then away from it, which is what's happening in the West, to already make homes that people find attractive, but are also climate resilient? And then more sophisticated still are ideas like, which is basically very low cost air conditioning. Air conditioning with, with very little energy, no pollutants, no fluorohydrocarbons and so on, where you use the fact that beneath the earth, just two or three, four meters down, the temperature is pretty constant. And in the summer, it's much cooler than up here. So in the summer, you can take heat out of the home and put it into the earth. And if you like, in the winter, you can take it back and warm the, if you want to warm it, depending on the climate. So this will, in the long term, slightly warm the earth, but there's enough there for it to, to, be, um, to be manageable. So these are just some examples, and they're just scratching the surface, really. I'm just giving you a, f a few pointers uh, to say that there's actually plenty to experiment with plenty to do. And the question is, how? what is the path to doing any of these things? So this is the house that uh, I was I lived in, in Sevagram, and Abhay, and I used to play in, or, or actually we didn't play much, we used to read. <laughs> and actually that's my mother, and uh, I think it's my younger brother in the pram. And just around the corner, was Bapu Kuti, and we lived in a place which was completely in harmony with nature. I, I think if we did the calculations, we probably absorbed more CO2 from the atmosphere than we put into it because of the crops, the agriculture, the way we used everything. Um, the only, th I mean, there was some wood burning, there was charcoal, and there was gobar gas, uh, but generally it was, and it was a comfortable life. Now, people aren't going to go and live like that. Everybody will want hot and cold running water and shower, everything. I think that the modern world is here to stay. But actually, we need the ingenuity to do that and provide that for everyone equitably while still working with nature rather than against nature. And I think to some extent, in Garishiroli in search, that's already happening. This is very emblematic. I love this tree growing out. It's as if the house has made space for the tree. It's given way, you know, and it's, it's working in harmony one with the other. So with that, I, uh, I leave you with that thought. Thank you.
Thank you very much for a very, very picturesque, scientific, fact based, yet eye opening presentation. All of us have been reading newspapers and magazines, so all these passing remarks, but you presented in a very really succinct, logical manner. And what is happening globally, what happened historically, what happened in three dimensional space, this beautiful presentation. Your last uh, but then you also provide <coughs> some direction that instead of only focusing on reducing global change, we have to focus more for the local. Yeah. And that's what search will be able to consider doing. Right now we are not very clear what. First, what is needed is really a will and a will. Once we have that will, then we, we can go into details as to what can be done and that that can that need not be very just instinctive answer, that has to be more scientific, scientific. answer. And several other people and agencies have worked much more on this. We need to really consult them, take their inputs. And then finally identify small pieces of action. We won't be able to do global action. What to do the small pieces of local actions which will save people's lives? As I just said, that apart from death, disease, disability, and difficulties of living. So, group challenge, challenge. Thank you for opening this subject and also opening this direction. We we need to do further brainstorming on this. Brainstorming as well as hard stuff. <laughs>